Hi, I'm T. Thomas. I'm the uh, Western Sales Rep for uh, Anywave Communications. Um, I'm here with my uh, general manager, uh, Dave Neff. Do you want to say hi, Dave? Hi, everybody. Yeah, we're, we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, some next-gen ATSC3 equipment, and also we're going to talk a little bit about on-channel repeaters, SFNs, and some... Uh, trials that are going on actually up in your area with some uh, uh, gap fillers. So uh, we're going to get this thing started here. Uh, I'm going to give you a little history of Anywave. I don't know if you all heard of us or not. Uh, we've been around since uh, 2004, uh, actually 2007, but uh, back in 2001, some engineers from Zenith uh, formed a company called Lynx, and they developed the first chip to fix the multipath problem with uh, ATSC1. Uh, 8VSB has a problem with multipath, and, and they figured out a uh, an algorithm, put it on a chip so that the receivers would actually work. So uh, that happened, and that company was sold in 20, uh, 2004, 2007. Anyway, it was uh, formed in any way is a U.S. corporation and it's based in Illinois. A uh, couple other things is the uh, any way assisted in the CMB, CMMB standard uh, in Asia for digital television. Uh, they have a number of uh, patents including a unique algorithm for amplifier linearity correction the, this corrects your uh, transmitter for uh, linear and nonlinear uh, errors from the amplifier and the filter. Uh, we've got uh, another patent that we're going to talk about here today for the gap fillers. Uh, it's a very unique uh, solution to gap fillers uh, to where we can actually use them in an ATSC-1 environment. Uh, and since uh, 2007, we've delivered over 6,000 trans, uh, uh, 6, ex, uh, transmitters and 16,000 exciters. Um, our corporate headquarters is in Vernon Hills, Chicagoland area. Uh, we do order fulfillment, transmitter assembly, tests, uh, equipment service repair, retuning, uh, technical support, and uh, our call center is US, U.S. based. Uh, you don't have to call somebody somewhere else. It's all U.S. based. And all of our returns are to Chicago. Uh, AnyWave is one of the largest worldwide leaders in broadcast development and production. Uh, we sell the equipment that we produce. We don't uh, second source anything. We produce it all ourselves. Kind of the uh, company philosophy, and I think this is this is important to know what the philosophy of the company that you're you're working with. It's uh, a company focused on pro production, not fancy advertising. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, companies with slick websites and everything, and and that's just bloat that uh, goes to the bottom line when you buy a transmitter. Um, companies with uh, our company is customer focused, uh, looking for the best solution, not just what's available. A company that's dedicated to producing some of the most efficient, longest lasting transmitters available. And a company that introduces technical advances first, providing customers with greater performance. Uh, what that means is basically, uh, we're typically ahead of the curve in the performance of things. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dave. He's going to talk about SFNs to you. And uh, so I'm going to mute okay. myself and give it over to Dave. All right. Uh, so I started talking about SFNs and why do, you, why do you do SFNs? Well, it's to provide a strong signal for all parts of the coverage area, um, especially in 3.0, ATSC 3.0. Um, a lot of people are interested in indoor reception, mobility, overcoming terrain obstructions. Uh, all those things uh, lead you to want to optimize coverage 
Um, and some things have happened in the recent years to, to really allow that. Um, one is that the FCC, there's a report and order for DTS. And DTS stands for Distributed Transmission Systems. Uh, you also see it called SFN, Single Frequency Networks. Um, oh, there we go. Um, and so a new report and order for DTS was released uh, January of 21. And it did a couple of things. One, it clearly defined the spillover restrictions. Uh, before, they just had uh, some vague language like uh, there was only minimal interference could be, uh, could be provided by the SFN. And now they've uh, defined it pretty clearly. And um, uh, basically, you can't extend the 50-50 contour of the primary station. You can only uh, fill in coverage within that contour. You can't go beyond it. Um, but that's kind of what we said. You know, you want to you want to fill in gaps in the coverage area, uh, not extend it. Uh, the rule, the uh, report order also allowed LPTV to deploy uh, DTS or SFN without using an experimental license. In the past, LPTVs, uh, the only way they could do this was a, was an experimental license. Uh, now, now they can uh, go through and apply the normal way. However, uh, there was a form that the FCC had to create uh, to, for LPTVs, and uh, they haven't done that yet. So, if you want to apply uh, for SFN as an LPTV, you have to do an STA at this time. Um, ATSC3 is OFDM, which is uh, much better for single frequency networks because it has a guard interval. And as long as you uh, have the delay from the uh, unwanted signal within that guard interval, then it should work very well. As opposed to ATSC1, uh, the receiver equalizers were not quite uh, the best at uh, multipath or on channel interference. So anyway, we've supplied these products for quite a while, since 2010, but these above uh, key enablers really enhance the uh, opportunities. You can see we deployed in uh, 2010, we did a DVB-T gap filler in uh, Taiwan. 2018, we did an ATSC-1 uh, gap filler for NBC Universal in Puerto Rico. And also 2021, we did some ATSC-3 SFN with gap fillers in uh, Bend, Oregon. Bend and Redmond, Oregon, which I'll talk some more about in a little in a little bit. So when I say SFNs, there's there's really two ways to go about that. You can have multiple transmitters in your coverage area operating on the same channel, and these are all sort of separate standalone transmitters uh, with their own exciter and broadcasting their own signal. But all those transmitters are synchronized, um, and there's timing and synchronizing information that's get that gets fed to each transmitter from a central site. And so the synchronizing is such that all transmitters emit the same signals on the same frequency at the same time. And I say approximately the same time because you have the ability to adjust the delay, the uh, differential delay from one transmitter with respect to the other. And that's part of the network planning. That's how you optimize coverage is adjust the delay so that the greatest percentage of the population uh, will not have harmful interference. So as I said, each transmitter originates the signal. There's an exciter in every transmitter. They're all locked together with these timing and synchronizing signals and GPS. Um, it requires a point-to-point -point link from the ATSC 3.0 gateway to each transmitter. You notice I say ATSC 3 here. Uh, ATSC 1 is uh, at this time really not possible. Now there have been ATSC 1 SFNs deployed. Uh, I was involved with uh, several of them in, in a prior life. Um, but the companies that made hardware for that ATSC 1 SFN uh, no longer exist or no longer make the hardware. So uh, I've looked around for it and I, I, don't, I don't think anybody makes it anymore. So for that reason, uh, ATSC-1 SFN is, is really not possible with, uh, with synchronized transmitters. Um, the other thing about synchronized transmitters is you can have significant power levels. This is really, you know, as long as you're not extending the coverage, there's nothing inherently limiting you from the power level. So that's one, that's one way of doing SFN is synchronized transmitters. 
Uh, the second way is with gap fillers. A gap filler uh, doesn't require a, a link like a, a fiber or microwave. Uh, it receives the signal from the main station off the air, just like a, a, a translator would. Uh, however, unlike a translator, this, this repeats it on the same channel. So no point-to-point -point link needed. Uh, it's inherently synchronized. Like if you look at the rules that the FCC uh, laid out in that report and order, they don't really talk about gap fillers, but they do say that the transmitters have to be synchronized. Well, a gap filler is synchronized because it just repeats the same signal. It does processing on it, but it doesn't, you know, demodulate, remodulate, and create new signals. It's, it just takes the same signal and passes it along. So it's inherently synchronized. Um, and because, because it doesn't uh, require an exciter or, you know, the timing and synchronizing information, uh, this a gap filler can work for ATSC one or ATSC three. It doesn't matter. It just passes through the signal, amplifies it, and does some uh, error correction. Um, but uh, because it's receiving a signal on the same channel that it's transmitting, uh, feedback from the output, the input of the gap filler can be limited. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. So this is an example of a gap filler. Uh, that's an outdoor unit that we're showing there. We have both indoor and outdoor versions. Uh, the outdoor version, really everything is outside on the pole. Uh, we, we run power up through a uh, power over ethernet link and uh, everything's outside. We also have an indoor version, if you, especially if you want higher power, you don't want uh, transmitter and filter to be sitting outside you can do an indoor gap filler and have higher power levels. Um, but as I said, the feedback signal from the output to the input must be dealt with uh, or else you'll have an oscillator. Uh, so you can do that with antenna directivity and isolation of the transmit and receive antennas on the gap filler. And uh, when, when you've done as much as you can with that, then uh, the rest is left to echo cancellation in the gap filler. Next slide. Okay. So this uh, this graph just gives you an example of the type of echo cancellation that we can do in our gap filler. Uh, what this graph shows is on the horizontal axis, it shows echo strength in dB. The vertical axis is output MER in dB. So what that means is that if you have uh, the echo strength is is basically the the echo that's seen at the at the receiver of the gap filler. In other words, the, the the part that's looking at the main transmitter, uh, there's there's also going to be feedback signal. Uh, if you go back, T, can you go back one slide? Yeah. So so this receive antenna on the left here is is aimed at the main transmitter trying to receive the signal. But you see the loop here, the feedback loop, the output of the gap filler also feeds back signal to the to that receive antenna. And that's undesired, that causes interference. So uh, go back to the next slide. So this graph is a representation of how much interference you have. So if we go all the way to the left, zero dB, that means there's no feedback. You have perfect isolation between the input of the gap filler and the output of the gap filler. You have no echo strength. Well, in that case, uh, you see the flat line here, it's about just about 36 dB MER that is being uh, produced. And so the gap filler doesn't degrade that hardly at all uh, because there's no echo feedback. It just, it just does its thing. But uh, that's not the real world. Um, if, you, if you go over to, let's say, the midpoint there, 30 dB echo strength. Okay, so what that means, just think about that for a minute. That means that the, the echo, the undesired signal coming back from the output of the gap filler to the input, is 30 dB higher, a thousand times higher than the signal that you're trying to receive from the main transmitter. And yet the echo cancellation that we provide in this gap filler corrects that uh, feedback signal out to the point that you still achieve 32 dB MER at the output of the gap filler, even with an undesired signal of a thousand times larger than the desired signal. So, um, you can see that's that's kind of a key 
technology that enables these gap fillers in. and we we think we have the the world's best algorithm for that we've uh, researched this and tested it and uh, uh, it's it's really really powerful so um, that's kind of a key metric for for gap fillers the ability to cancel that echo because uh, if you can't do that, uh, it's very limiting in terms of the amount of output power that you can provide from the gap filler. Uh, otherwise, your signal is very degraded. And in the worst case, you know, the feedback can cause the thing to oscillate and, uh, and uh, destroy itself. So, um, so that's gap fillers. Uh, also, in talking about coverage solutions, um, We've made translators for years. We make ATSC1 trans translators and sold a lot of them, uh, especially out in the west, uh, western US. Um, but now ATSC 3.0 is starting to roll out. And um, so we make, a, we make an ATSC 3 translator as well. Uh, of course, it's ATSC 3 input and ATSC 3 output uh, on a different channel because it's a translator. Uh, we also have the capability within the translator Later to add and drop programs. And we can do that in ATSC 1 or ATSC 3. Uh, that's pretty important because there's another uh, uh, new report in order that's actually on, this, on the street right now um, to refine, uh, uh, clarify the rules for Part 74. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the FCC rules still had a lot of references to analog in it and were just very outdated. So they uh, they went and updated the rules, and in that there, you have the capability to uh, not just repeat the signal with the translator uh, un, unaltered. Uh, you have the ability to uh, actually broadcast two or more uh, repeat the signals of two or more trans transmitters with the translator, as long as you have agreement from the station to to do that. Uh, you don't have to just repeat one channel. You can you can take signals from uh, multiple transmitters and multiply them together in this in this translator. In addition to that, uh, the FCC has some requirements for station identification. Uh, you can do that with uh, PSIP and TSID. Uh, the F and the ATSC three equivalents of that. Uh, you also have the ability to broadcast some. Uh, emergency programming or uh, programming that's uh, uh, related to the funding of the of the translator. Uh, so the point is that you can do different things. You can manipulate the signal that's coming out of the translator to be somewhat different than the incoming signal, um, and that's that's kind of new. So we have the ability to do that. We can we can allow you to add and drop programs, take in programs from multiple sources over the air or otherwise uh, as long as you can deliver it there we can we can uh, put it into the multiplexer and insert it into the stream uh, we've got uh, one of these deployed so far in harrisburg pennsylvania uh, we'll be releasing some test uh, results of that pretty soon uh, press release about it but uh, so we, we've got pretty much everything covered atsc3 translators gap fillers uh, sfn transmitters uh, we, we can do all those things. Um, also, we have the ability to do transcoding. Because some of you might think, well, a main station is switching to ATSC3, but a translator might want to stay on ATSC1 because you know, the population of people that have ATSC3 receivers is not very high. So somebody might want to do that, receive ATSC3 and output ATSC1. Uh, we can do that too. All right, next slide, please. Okay, we also have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a system on the air in uh, in Bend and Redmond, Oregon. Uh, we've been engaged by a company up there, Rural Link, and Rural Link is a company that's uh, uh, it's owned partly by uh, Watch TV. You might have heard of Watch TV up there. They have a uh, four channel ATSC3 system that's been running for several years. Um, but they wanted to trial this and they're really looking at doing some uh, new things with ATSC3, like uh, data delivery to vehicles, uh, 
actually used in the TV white space channels in between the, the uh, license channels that they have. And uh, so this has been uh, going on for the past couple of years. We've uh, got this system built and it's, it's deployed now and available for testing. And if you go to the next slide, I'll show you some details of that. Okay, so there's, uh, as I said, there's two cities, Bend and Redmond, where we have equipment. In Bend, there's two different sites. This is the main site here. There's a two kilowatt transmitter, ATSC 3.0 on channel 17 a one kilowatt transmitter on channel 16, ATSC 3.0. And these are originating transmitters with exciters. And then there's a gap filler on channel 25. A channel 25 is one of the uh, main transmitters in, um, in Redmond, the other, the other city. So this gap filler on channel 25 is just repeating the Redmond signal into the bend area. Um, and all of those go through a three channel combiner. And you notice that the uh, two kilowatt and one kilowatt are on adjacent channels. So that made the channel combiner a little tricky. But um, so we put all three of those into one common antenna and broadcast that from, uh, from one power. So that's the Ben main site. Now, next slide. And this is the second site at Ben. There's uh, just another gap filler there at the second site. And, uh, and that's receiving channel 25, which was which is the main transmitter at Redmond. Okay, so this is the Redmond main site. We've got a one kilowatt tra transmitter channel 25, gap filler on 16. Remember, 16 was one of the channels from Ben that was being broadcast. So we're just repeating that. Uh, we have a receive antenna and then combined into a two channel combiner into one common transfer antenna. Next slide. So um, that's a little bit about the, uh, the system in, uh, in Oregon that we have. Again, it's ATSC 3.0. It's, it's, uh, it's got uh, gap fillers. Um, it's got our transmitters and uh, like I said, testing is going on right now. Um, T, you want to take over here? We're talking about the standard product line again. Uh, you want to pick sure. up uh, this point? Yeah. Thanks, Dave. That was great. Uh, you did a great job on that. Uh, this is just a little uh, a little bit about our transmitters and, and what we have as a product line. Uh, and And... Our product line, we, we do things as standard where some other people will make it options. Uh, uh, we're <clears throat> every modulator has our uh, RF inputs built in. Uh, it's, a, it's a translator, transcoder, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's standard as part of our exciters. Uh, our exciters also have adaptive pre-correction. Uh, this en enhances the performance of the translators uh, or the transmitters. Uh, pushes your uh, your curve out so that you uh, you got your ultimate coverage. Uh, most of the time, you don't see that in low powers, but we provide that in in low power translators as well. Uh, actually, every transmitter we we provide has that uh, digital adaptive pre-correction. Uh, the any <clears throat> any wave exciters um, display receive signal level, receive signal to noise. Uh, and they all operate as a, as a translator. So you, you don't have to go in and, and look at a computer. All this is displayed on the front panel. You know exactly if you're tweaking up an ant receive antenna, you can get the, the receive signal level and the signal to noise right in the front panel of it. Um, then it also has a real-time measurement of the, uh, the signals, the IMD, uh, transmitted signal to noise, and percentage of power right on the front panel. So uh, it, these are just standards that, uh, that some of the other companies don't do. Come on. Okay. Um, now we, we've introduced since COVID and, and we kind of saw a, a, a shift in the solid state devices that are going to be available going forward and 
So we started designing with the new uh, BLF 989 uh, solid state devices, replacing the old uh, 888, uh, BLF 888 devices that uh, basically everybody else is still using. Uh, we're finding those uh, 888s are becoming harder and harder to find. And so we decided back two years ago to begin the migration to the new one. And what you're seeing here is a picture of a two kilowatt transmitter. It's actually five rack units tall, less than five rack, it's four and a half. A four and a half rack unit tall device uh, puts out 2.2 kilowatts and fits in a 19 inch rack about 30 inches deep. So uh, we, we, with the 989 and the use of graphene and the other technologies that we put in there, we can, we can compact these things very tight and they're still very, very robust. Uh, we're multi-standard. We have ATSC-1, ATSC-3, or any worldwide standard that you want. Uh, our UHF transmitters cover from 14 to 36. No retuning. Uh, you just change the exciter frequency, uh, retune the filter, and you're on a new channel. Uh, VHF bands 1 and band 3, we also have those. Again, this is the low power, uh, uh, the highest powered L uh, LD MOS device. It's three, we get 300 watts per device, uh, and it's a UHF Doherty design. Our uh, VHF band threes are also Doherty, which makes them uh, very efficient, very rugged. Uh, and then we have the industry leading adaptive correction, uh, linear, non linear correction. Uh, the cooling is very simple in and the front, out in the back, so it, it makes it very easy for air uh, airflow in your building. You just apply cool air to the front of the rack, you exhaust the hot air out the back, and it's very simple as far as HVAC to, uh, to do these. No special uh, plumbing, no special uh, uh, duct work required. And then we also can do remote control via Web browser or SNMP. Uh, this is our new AnyWave ATSC3 exciter. Uh, there's a few things that sets this apart. Uh, it does all the standards. Uh, it does everything basically as any of the other ones. But the difference is, is that everybody else builds them on a computer. So you have a computer sitting in your rack and uh, they're very sensitive to temperature changes and things of that nature. This is a hardware solution. This, this is built on a FPGA platform, the same as our exciters have been since uh, 2007. And they're very, very robust. They don't, they typically don't break. Uh, that's one of the beauty, beauties of having a, a hardware solution over a software solution. Uh, but anyway, it has a flexible architecture. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff, split configurations of having a, a, your gateway locally, gateway remotely, uh, does SFNs, uh, just anything that, that you need out of an exciter, uh, this will do. Uh, now, it does not have, this one does not have a tuner in it. Um, we opted to put the tuner in the signal and gateway server. Uh, this was because uh, in, AC, uh, in the new rule changes with the uh, possibility of uh, drop and add uh, channel capability, we felt like it would be better in like a uh, the gateway to where we could do more with it, especially in ATSC3. So ATSC3, you route uh, MPEG dash segments, you don't run um, MPEG-2 video, uh, ATSC-3 is 100% uh, data. It's not video, so um, you have to take a different type of approach when it comes to ATSC-3. And uh, since it is all IP data, it's very easy to go ahead and build in the MUX and build in the, uh, the, the multiple... Uh, multiple uh, segments that you need for 
uh, the way you can build ATS C3 is very different in operation, and, and this isn't a time to talk about that, but uh, the PLPs the, and subframes, these are where you can, you can have one stream, very robust, you know, get it down to almost zero signal noise, and you can pick the thing up, but it's very limited in data, or you can go with a, a big data pipe, and it does, it's not it's harder to pick up. So you have a lot of options in ATSC3. This offers uh, all the features of electronic uh, service guide, uh, emergency alert, and just every option that you need. Uh, plus, this gateway signaling server has a tuner in it. It'll pick up either ATSC1 or ATSC3. So with that, you can actually mix in local uh, data signals that come up through another um, STL or digital microwave, and you can you can do add drop cherry picking uh, any kind of thing you want in a in a translator. This would be good in a um, lighthouse configuration. Uh, just uh, a lot of different options. And it, again, it is a hardware solution. It's not a piece of software. Um, we offer, you know, transmitters, UHF band one, band three, uh, ATSC one and three, power levels from one watt to over 100 kilowatts of liquid cooled, uh, exciters, translators, SFNs, power amplifiers, encoders, gateways, baseband processors, components. We're a one-stop shop. Anything in, in TV broadcasting on the, on the uh, transmission side, we can offer it. We offer it, we do it very well. Okay, uh, summary to this, you know, success in broadcast industry today, it is more, more important than ever to partner with a US owned company. I, I believe that is a, that's a strong thing. We are a US owned company and that we build equipment in-house. We have our own manufacturing and we build 100% of what we sell. Uh, use equipment designed and built by the company, not just rebrands other products. Uh, a lot of companies out there, they just, they'll buy this piece from this manufacturer and this piece from this manufacturer and take it in their garage and put it together. Um, use a, use, uh, you need to use a company with worldwide resources and technological experience that allows you to move with the future changes. We talked a lot about uh, SFNs and uh, white space today. These are the futures. Um, these are gonna start in, uh, in time affecting the reception at your translators. Most of you guys probably have TV translators. Uh, you could have a problem with those as the white space and as some of these uh, SS FSNs get into place, it's going to uh, give uh, some fits maybe to uh, input channels. I know I, I, I worked in uh, out of Lubbock, Texas, and, and we had uh, New Mexico was part of our facility. And when we started repacking, we started having problems with input channels because... Uh, Translators were affecting translator input channels that were 100 miles from the main channel. Uh, this is only get worse as, as the uh, SFNs and, and things of that nature go on. Uh, so you need to have a, a company you partner with that, that understands this, that moves with it, can be flexible. And also a company that uh, is corporately stable and flexible. We're a small company, we're flexible. We, uh, we look at what's going on in society and the broadcasting, and that's what we do. So anyway, it hits all these marks. Uh, and that's the last one, I think. It dropped out on me. Hang on a second. What happened to it? My slides really went away. Yeah, that's it. Do we have any questions?
Everybody's sleepy from lunch. <laughs> well, well, T, uh, my name is Dennis Hunt. I'm the chapter chairman here for Eugene Springfield. And uh, T and Dave, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, quite interesting. And uh, we appreciate it in uh, sponsoring the uh, lunch. Thank you. My pleasure. So there's no questions? I'm curious how uh, what kind of what kind of power you get from your from your POE powered uh uh billers? Uh okay, the POE that we use, that is actually just a receive box that we have up on the top. Uh it's it's a it, it it's a comparator box that we actually use a signal from the transmitter and we and we sample that at the, the receive antenna so that's all we do with that now we do have uh, a normal broadcast transmitter you know we could put 100 watts thousand watts whatever you need into uh the transmitter antenna yeah, we, we make gap fillers sort of standard product up to 400 watts yeah yeah we can do that. I was just trying to figure out how you get enough much power over PoE. As in my experience, is oh no, that's just that's just for the receiver. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, we get the uh, the first thing. There's one box that's always outdoors, uh, whether it's a uh, indoor or outdoor gap filler. There's one box that has to be raked at the receive antenna. Uh, we have kind of a two stage echo cancellation process. One is analog, and one's a digital process. The analog box is always outside, uh, right by the receiver antenna, and that's what gets the PLE power. All right, thanks. We're wondering what kind of Ethernet switch is putting out 400 watts to <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not. It, there, the only thing that uses the PLE is a receive box. It is not the transmitter. Okay, yeah. not the transmitter. Okay. So you see it on the. So the uh, the uh, uh, it is coming back over the over the Design. Ethernet back to the transmitter half of the these guys. Oh, okay. The way the way that works, just so you kind of get a better picture, is we have an outdoor box, and that outdoor box has two antenna ports on the input. And then it had a, has a summation antenna output. That's what actually goes down and feeds the receiver in the gap filler. The POE is the power over it, and it also has control. So there's algorithms that talk to the box on top of the uh, tower and the box at the bottom of the tower. So that Ethernet has communication from the both, commu uh, both boxes. But up at the top, it's only received. There is no power to speak of. It's just uh, a, a couple of comparative type uh, algorithm boxes. So, so if you had an, an application where you had a, uh, like a community you wanted to, to fill in uh, in kind of a, a ravine, mm -hmm. you could get the receive antenna on the, on the main transmitter side of the hill and the, and the uh, Okay, you, the transmit the other eye, how far apart can you split those? We're actually experimenting with a uh, antenna design that they could be on the same tower. Oh, about yeah. at least uh, at least six wavelengths apart. But because we do actually sample the transmit antenna, most what you're talking about is the old style where they had back in the day where they received on one side of the mountain, transmitted on the other, and the mountain blocked it. What we do is we don't have to have that. We actually take a reference signal from the transmitter and compare the receive signal with the transmit signal and null the transmit signal out in, in the outdoor box, the tower top box, before it ever gets down going into the, uh, the gap filler downstairs. And then we have additional corrections in there. That's what makes, uh, that's where our um, patent 
comes in. We have that. That's an actual patented device. Anything else? That might be it. Okay. Uh, okay, we're waiting for a dollar finger. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The gift be discount. Um, so thanks again. Sure. And uh, again, you could... Uh, do you have our contact information on the on the email that was shipped out? Um, if you want any more information, if you want more, uh, more detail or, or need some equipment, uh, please give us a call or send us an email. Uh, if you allow the the SBE group to send us your email, we'll put you on the email list, keep you abreast of all the stuff that we have coming out. Uh, so please uh, allow them to give us your email. We will not bombard you with a lot of spam. We don't do that. But we do send out routine um, email letters. Everything else, David? No, I don't think so. Well, again, thanks, everybody, for your time and attention. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. And thank again, you. thank you for... In Springfield, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay.